That's amazing. All right, je crois qu'on va commencer. I think we'll start. Alors, euh, bonjour à tous. Je, je m'appelle Paul Desroches et je représente les bains de Californie au Québec. Euh, je suis fier de vous présenter la toute première session de sommelier Made in Québec. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on va avoir droit à un séminaire qui est tout spécial pour commencer l'année. On a concocté un webinaire qui va allier les deux éléments qui sont très précieux pour euh, les deux producteurs de cet événement, donc euh, l'histoire familiale et le développement durable. Donc, euh, au cours de cette prochaine heure, on va découvrir certains des vins les plus représentatifs de deux AVAs particulières, le Livermore Valley et Oakville, en Californie. Donc, je suis joint par Phil Wempy, vigneron de quatrième génération de Wempy Family Estates, et par Susan Groth, qui est vigneron de deuxième génération de Groth Vineyards and Winery. Welcome to both of you. We're delighted to have you here with us. Thanks, Tom. Et nos hôtes d'aujourd'hui sont Geneviève Boisvert et Alexander Smith. Geneviève a obtenu son diplôme de sommellerie de l'École hôtelière des Laurentides en 1998. Elle a occupé plusieurs rôles en marketing au Canada et aux États-Unis pour des marques mondialement reconnues comme Moi Tennessee, Constellation, Vigneur Azuriz et Marnier Lapostel Chili. Geneviève a rejoint les rangs de Wendy Family Estates en 2018, où elle occupe un rôle de directrice régionale des ventes. Alexander Smith est cofondateur de Vin par Alexander, une agence de vins spiritueux créée en 2019. Alexander est certified sommelier et un amoureux des vins du Nouveau Monde. Il croit que le maire de la Californie peut égaler le maire de la France. Avant de créer son agence de représentation, Alexander écrivait pour le site web Points on Wine. Son objectif avec Wines by Alexander est d'améliorer la représentation des vins du Nouveau Monde au Québec. Quelques petites règles maison. Donc, premièrement, ce webinaire est enregistré. Vous recevrez tous un lien vers la vidéo dans les journées à venir. Ça prend à peu près une semaine. Euh, ensuite, en tant que spectateur, vous êtes tous sur mute et vos caméras sont fermées euh, pendant toute la durée du webinaire. Cependant, vous remarquerez que vous avez deux modes de communication. Il y a la boîte de chat où vous pourrez communiquer à tous les membres et à tous les spectateurs. Je vous ai cliqué sur « All ». Et vous avez aussi une boîte de questions et réponses ou Q&A où vous pourrez poser vos questions aux panélistes du webinaire. Je n'ai vous surtout pas pour l'utiliser. On a conçu le webinaire pour vous, les membres de l'industrie du vin. Donc, non seulement pour vous offrir une séance d'information, mais aussi comme un moyen d'échanger avec les producteurs, les, les autres sommeliers et de poser vos questions. Je vous invite donc à poser des questions aux panélistes tout au long du webinaire, en anglais ou en français. On va s'efforcer d'y répondre dès que possible. Et si on n'a pas le temps pendant le webinaire, je vous invite à me les faire parvenir et je les transférerai aux personnes concernées. Par ailleurs, nos producteurs d'aujourd'hui étant anglophones, on va naviguer entre le français et l'anglais au courant du webinaire. Si vous avez des questions, si vous avez besoin qu'on traduise des morceaux, n'hésitez surtout pas, on va y venir le plus rapidement possible. Donc, sans plus attendre, sans plus attendre, bienvenue au fabuleux Wine Country. On espère que vous voyez l'écran parce que moi, je ne suis pas sûr. Donc, donc, on va commencer avec Geneviève Boba de Wempy Family Estates. Donc, avec les vins de Wempy, on se retrouve dans l'évier de Livermore Valley, qui est juste ici. Donc, Geneviève, s'il te plaît, tu peux nous parler un tout petit peu de Wempy. Oui, bonjour. Euh, merci à tous et à toutes d'être là. Euh, je vais laisser évidemment la place à Phil le, le, plus, le plus longtemps possible, euh, mais je voulais peut-être euh, bon, mentionner d'emblée en fait que euh, Wenty Vineyard a été fondé en 1883 euh, et, puis, euh, et puis voilà par un homme qui s'appelle Karl Wenty euh, qui était euh, en fait allemand donc il est venu s'installer euh, en Californie au départ il avait choisi euh, la vallée de Napa mais ensuite euh, il a décidé finalement de s'installer à Livermore où il a acheté euh, à l'époque 47 acres euh, pourquoi Livermore? On ne le sait pas trop. Mon, mon feeling, c'est lui, il trouvait que le terroir, euh, et particulièrement le climat, était plus adapté à ce, à ce qu'il qu préférait. Donc, euh, et voilà. Et aujourd'hui, nous sommes, euh, la, la winery est à Livermore. Euh, nous avons aussi euh, nos vignobles à Livermore, mais nous avons aussi des vignes à, à Arroyo Seco Monterey. Donc, euh, et je voulais peut-être juste toucher un petit peu les produits que vous allez déguster, mais aussi l'historique euh, des produits ici euh, au Québec euh, ou même au Canada. Donc, les, les vins de Wente sont arrivés euh, d'abord par la côte ouest. 
Donc, on a commencé à travailler les vins euh, il y a déjà 26 ans, en fait, euh, en Colombie-Britannique. Et puis, euh, on est avec importation épicurienne maintenant ici euh, au Québec. Et puis, euh, on a introduit Morning Fog, qui est un des produits euh, qu'on va présenter aujourd'hui, en euh, 2009. Donc, on était en spécialité au départ. Et ensuite de ça, on est allé en approvisionnement continu. Et euh, on a eu beaucoup de succès avec le Morning Fog qui est dû euh, en grande partie à plusieurs d'entre vous, je suis certaine, et aussi aux consultants en vin. Donc, c'est un vin qui était particulièrement aimé pour son style. Euh, il est arrivé un style beaucoup plus frais. Hein? Je veux dire, à Livermore, comme vous avez vu, on est, euh, on est vraiment dans, euh, très, très près de, de, la, de la baie de San Francisco. Donc, c'est un climat qui est relativement frais. Donc, un vin tout en fraîcheur et aussi peu boisé. Donc, euh, à l'époque, les chardonnays étaient encore très, très boisés en Californie. Et euh, donc, nous, on était différents à ce niveau-là. Un petit vent de fraîcheur qui provenait de la Californie. Donc, c'est le Morning Fog. Et puis, euh, et, puis en, et puis, ensuite, on est passé en produits courants. Donc, c'était une une requête de la part de la SEQ euh, qui nous a demandé de, par de passer en produit courant, ce qu'on a fait finalement en 2018. Et on a introduit aussi en 2015 un, le Cabernet Sauvignon, Southern Hill Cabernet Sauvignon que, vous, euh, que nous allons présenter aujourd'hui aussi, qui est en approvisionnement continu. Donc, euh, je, sans plus tarder, je vais quand même laisser toute la place à Phil. Merci beaucoup, Phil. Thank you for being there. I'm going to leave all the space to you. And... Uh, Yeah, I might have some question, maybe not, but yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Genevieve. Um, so I think I, I understood about uh, a quarter of what you just said. Wow, okay. <laughs> um, uh, you did a little explanation of uh, where our family winery is, and um, we're in the uh, eastern portion of Alameda County alongside the San Francisco Bay only about the valley starts only about seven miles uh, east of the San Francisco Bay. And uh, uh, our family history is very typical of the sort of second start of the California wine industry in the uh, late 1870s, early 1880s, uh, when uh, the leaders of the industry really focused on bringing in fine uh, Bordeaux and uh, Burgundy varieties and uh, trying to achieve quality through proper plantings of the right varieties. And so my great grandfather, Carl Wente, settled in Livermore uh, in 1883 and was a beneficiary of this movement of planting fine varieties. And it was really uh, a golden era of the California wine industry and in that the majority of the vineyards were centered around the San Francisco Bay in Alameda, Napa, Sonoma and Santa Clara counties and uh, outstanding wine was made. And unfortunately, um, they had a, a, a success of it, but uh, prohibition came along and very few wineries that uh, were producing those really fine quality varietals prior to prohibition survived through prohibition. And those that did, many of them transformed their vineyards into uh, red shipping varieties to make homemade wine rather than focusing on the fine varieties that they had before prohibition. The lucky thing for Winty was that we were able to uh, have a, a, an agreement with George de la Tour of Bouillou Vineyards in Napa to produce all the white uh, wine that we could produce for him, which kept our uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon, Chardonnay, and other fine varietals in uh, first-class shape in our vineyards. And we had a winery full of outstanding wine. When repeal came in 1933, we were able to go back to the market much Uh, with the same fine wines that we had produced prior to Prohibition. There were very, very small amounts of those uh, vineyard acreages left. And it is one of the reasons that the Wente Sauvignon Blanc and the Wente Chardonnay are sort of the backbone of the, those two white varieties as they grew in uh, stature and acreage after Prohibition. Uh, people came to the Wente family in order to acquire Uh, cuttings or uh, plants to plant new vineyards and uh, the, um, the, the heritage uh, tradition of Wente supplying lots of vineyards around the state uh, uh, grew rapidly in the 40s and 50s. So uh, we're, we're very fortunate uh, to have been in that position and uh, continued to focus on those varieties up to that time. 
um, the morning fog uh, that uh, we're tasting today is uh, uh, from the Livermore Valley. It uh, is a direct descendant of those uh, pre-prohibition vineyards that uh, uh, my great grandfather and grandfather planted uh, and uh, is really, I think, a, a beautiful wine that, that highlights the, the uh, morning fog that drifts into the Livermore Valley, creates the overnight coolness uh, and brings the wine to a beautiful acidity. It's roughly 50% barrel fermented and that goes through malolactic and the other 50% is stainless steel fermented and uh, does not go through malolactic. So it has, while some beautiful toasty vanilla notes from the oak, it also has this beautiful sort of green apple pear nuance from the, uh, the, the stainless steel fermented portion. So I'm gonna take a little sip of that. Mm. Perfect for this time of day. Um, oh, and we shared a screen that uh, has uh, some of the winemaker notes on it. So um, I hope that uh, you all can share and see that. I, I won't reiterate that, but as the family uh, progressed from the, um, the, the devastation of prohibition and the very slow reintroduction of California wines uh, to the US market and to the world market, um, we continue to focus basically on our tradition of growing our own grapes and trying to be a state grown uh, and to, to being great farmers and stewards of the land. Uh, and so today we uh, are very proud to say that we're a certified sustainable California winery, um, which is a, uh, a term that uh, has been embraced by the California Certified Sustainable Winery Association that has a system that comes through and creates a set of sustainable rules throughout your business, not just wine growing, but uh, throughout all of your practices in winemaking, marketing from top to bottom. And uh, we uh, were one of the first wineries to achieve that certified sustainable uh, label. It's something that is logical, practical, uh, down to earth, and that we've been doing for 130 years uh, in the sense that if you're not sustainable, you don't sustain your business and you don't sustain yourself. So we're very proud of that. We're implementing a lot of new practices that uh, are, are really, I think, on the uh, edge of cutting edge. My daughter has been working on a project with a, a company called the Monarch Tractor Company that uh, has an autonomous uh, electric tractor that's autonomous driving that programs to farm the vineyards. Uh, and uh, it's a marvel to see. So there's lots of wonderful new sustainable technology coming on that not only uh, is wonderful for the soil that uh, minimizes inputs, that uh, uh, respects the carbon uh, sequestration in the soil, uh, and also respects the, the, the equity of our workers and the profitability of our company. Uh, and let's see, we're also tasting today our Southern Hills Cabernet Sauvignon. And um, this, we call it Southern Hills. I'll just jump right into that. Uh, it's a 2018. Um, it's a compilation of vineyards that range about 15 miles across the Southern Hills uh, from west to east in the, in the South Livermore Valley. And so there are hillside plantings uh, that we ferment, we pick and ferment independently and then re-blend back into what we think is a beautifully balanced Cabernet. Take a little. Mm. So beautiful, big, rich, fruit-focused wine, some nice uh, rich oak and vanilla in the finish. Um, and um, I don't know if we have a text sheet to put up on that, but it is, I think, a beautifully balanced, soft, luscious Cabernet that um, uh, really is, is very expressive, uh, wonderful pairing with uh, lots of, of different creative imaginations on foods and uh, uh, beautifully balanced wine. Phil, so, I have a, oh, 
May I, I, have a, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, well, and now you're talking uh, about the cab. Actually, yes, in Livermore, and I had a, a question from a, a person. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, that person's name, but that person asked if we could talk about the other varietal that we are actually growing in Livermore. And that's that. And also, if we can talk about, you know, why Wente spread so quickly within, you know, California. And I'm thinking it certainly has something to do with the Chardonnay clone. So I'm hoping, you know, you can touch a little bit on that too, uh, if, you, if you can, yeah. Um, okay, so um, a bunch of questions there. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, the Livermore Valley is very typical of most of the coastal valleys uh, up and down the California coast in that the closer end of their side of the valley that is closest to the marine influence is cooler. So the closer you are to the ocean or the bay, the cooler it is in Napa, Carneros would be cooler than St. Helena. So in Livermore, uh, Dublin, Pleasanton is much cooler than all the way over to the uh, east side of the valley. So we're able to grow a number of varieties that match quite nicely with the, the gradual climatic change across the valley. Um, every two to three miles, you probably increase in warmth about a degree as you move away from the San Francisco Bay influence. We actually grow uh, 30 different varietals, but we really focus on what the market is, is dominant in. So um, Chardonnay is the largest selling varietal uh, in the United States anyway, and Cabernet is second, and those are our two biggest sellers. So obviously, our acreage reflects the uh, demand of the consumer, but uh, we do make a lot of small lot uh, varietals that, that we sell in our tasting rooms uh, from things like Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, Malbec, uh, from Simeon to uh, Viognier to in the whites uh, to Rieslings uh, and to late harvest Rieslings, um, things like that. So uh, we grow a wide number of varieties, uh, but uh, are really influenced by the market. The second question, if I remember, was the sort of the spread of the Winty heritage uh, Chardonnay clone. And as I was trying to point out that after prohibition, while there were probably somewhere between 150 and 200,000 acres of fine wine varietals prior to prohibition. By the end of prohibition, there was less than 10,000 acres of all of those varietals and they were very widely spread across the state and a lot of them not in very good condition. So those vineyards that did maintain uh, the heritage and the quality, the selection, and when I say heritage, quality and selection, what my grandfather did as did a lot of the early growers, not exclusive to us, was go out in the vineyard at harvest time, taste the grapes, mark the best vines with the best physiology, and only take uh, wood for expansion for new vineyards off of the best vines. So those growers who had a system of selecting and improving their uh, vineyards were the, the vineyards that most of the the new growers that wanted vines went to in order to get their wood. So we were a source on that for Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. Um, there were many vineyards in the Napa Valley that were good sources for Cabernet Sauvignon, as was the Concanon Vineyard and the Cresta Blanca Vineyard here in the Livermore Valley, uh, both sources of Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, so uh, it's an interesting history. Uh, it is one, that uh, people uh, often refer to as the Wente clones, but technically they're really Wente selections because a clone is from a single plant source. And uh, our original plantings were selections from historic vineyards in the Livermore Valley that my grandfather then improved on. Uh, and so when growers came to our vineyard, they usually took vines or yeah, vines from more than uh, one area. Uh, so they had a selection rather than a clone. Now UC Davis in the late 50s came in and made single vine selections of 
almost all of the varietals and created clones. So then they, they took a single vine and then expanded that into a selection that you could purchase from their foundation nursery. And those became referred to by clonal numbers. So um, the most popular clone of Chardonnay as an example is clone number four. The most popular clone of Sauvignon Blanc is clone number one. Now, let's see, did I miss another question? Uh, I have one question again. <laughs> um, uh, somebody here, Jérôme here is asking, why do we put a little bit of Gewerstraminer in our Chardonnay? So, um, one of the, the uh, I think, fun signature things about our winemaking team is that uh, we grow those 30 varieties and have the opportunity to play with them in small amounts in blending, like using seasoning or spice in cooking, where you're putting something together and you add just a little bit and it brightens it up. Uh, and I think that's what the Gwirtschminer does. It's a very floral, um, pretty nose with just a little bit. It's, it, in, in our instance, I think it adds to the uh, aromatic uh, enjoyment of the Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not a 100% rule. We don't have a formula. Some years uh, it's not there. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a tool. It's a fun spice to be able to uh, use. Uh, very much like blending Cabernet, where people will use um, Merlot or Malbec or Petit Verdot for a little body um, to bring. Um, sometimes 100% Cabernet is better. So it's, it's, you know, no rules. No rules, yeah. And um, also in, uh, in, in Livermore Valley, we have how many hectares again? We have about a thousand hectares in Livermore Valley. Okay, yeah, and we have some, do you want to talk, even, th even thought we don't have the wine here, uh, but we do have one, uh, once in a while, we have the River Ranch Chard and the River Ranch Pinot Noir that are coming from Arroyo Seco. Would you mind, Phil, uh, touching that just quickly? I would be happy to. <laughs> so in, in uh, about oh, the early 1960s, uh, it looked as though the Livermore Valley was going to fall victim to urbanization. Uh, it's being such a central part of the Bay Area, only um, you know, 30 miles from San Francisco. Uh, it's obviously a um, very prime uh, urban center. And so in order to maintain, well, we didn't know if they would maintain a balance of farming or, or uh, let it all go to urbanization. So we started looking for a future spot to go. And my grandfather and father picked uh, an area in the Salinas Valley in Monterey County, about 20 miles south of Salinas called uh, the Arroyo Seco area. And it has a beautiful stream that flows through the vineyard of lots of gravelly soil. And we purchased that land in 1962 and started growing Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Riesling there. And uh, we make a Chardonnay from that uh, region called River Ranch. Uh, that was the historic name of the uh, vineyard or the, the farmland that we bought. It was not vineyard. Uh, we planted it to vineyard. And uh, it is a, uh, it's a smaller area uh, than we have here in the Livermore Valley only uh, about a mile across at where we farm over a 15 mile span here of different small vineyards uh, across the valley. We're just one single vineyard there in the Rose Seco area. Uh, and we named the Chardonnay Riva Ranch after uh, its historic founders. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think, uh, I don't know whether we mentioned it or not. I think it's important to mention that all went to wine, all the grapes that comes into wine are actually all estate grown, right? Uh, yeah. And so yeah, so I think it's important to mention that. And um, yeah, so one other question uh, is, um, how do you feel the climate has affected the winery in the past hundred years? Did it affect uh, the winery or the, the vineyards or the pr production or do you feel, yeah. I it's a question we get often in, in terms of climate change and uh, evolution of, of regions. And uh, so I've had the honor, privilege of being around here for 
uh, in, working after college for almost 50 years. And uh, I would have to say that I have seen very little significant change. Now, given, as I just pointed out, that um, there is gradual climatic change uh, all, in all of the coastal regions from closer you are to the marine influence to farther away, um, you can see that it would take a, quite a bit uh, to really overall change the, the, the warmth or climatic. So I guess my bottom line answer is I have not personally don't feel that I've seen much change. Will there be change? I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't have the same crystal ball as everybody else either, but uh, uh, I believe that one of the interesting things about the coastal marine influenced or Mediterranean climates is that uh, the coldness of the ocean around San Francisco is pretty substantially stable and uh, as uh, temperatures warm in the continental inland areas, it, it tends to draw more fog and wind off the ocean, potentially even make the coastal areas colder. Mm -hmm. um, Phil, I have a question, but I don't know how, it's probably gonna be hard to answer from Jérôme. It's in regards to uh, the uh, plantation, the, the density, but I'm guessing, do you, do, you, do you, can we say, talk about this very, very shortly, or is it some information that I could pot potentially send out? So uh, for us, over the last 25, 30 years, a standard density has been essentially five feet by eight feet. Um, so in metric, that's um, a meter and a half by two and a quarter, two and a third meters, uh, something like that. Um, and, uh, or yeah, two, 2.4. Uh, so uh, that's our standard. We do have vineyards that are closer spaced, uh, three by six feet. Uh, so one meter by two meters. Uh, and, um, uh, but part of, uh, what we've sort of learned is that uh, getting into a, a, a sustainable system is that having uh, uniformity really helps so mm -hmm. that you're able to be more efficient with your equipment and your people and your training and everything else. So we're really ten, trending, I guess, to one standard spacing, which would be the five by eight. Okay. And the yield per hectare, would you say, again, I'm guessing it varies, you know, from a place to another or no? It, the yield per acre is highly dependent on soil uh, fertility and vigor of the vines and then also the intent of the, the winemaker, wine grower. But if you think about it in a, in a general way, um, we trellis our vines on a wire. And at some point the shoots can only be so dense on the wire before they overlap each other and sunlight doesn't get to the leaves. So if you have a density somewhere between four and six shoots per foot, um, that is about as dense as you can make them. So then, um, let's say on an eight foot spacing, eight foot between the rows, um, you can only have so many shoots per hectare mm -hmm. and, uh, and your yield will be pretty standard. So our yield on an eight foot spacing is typically about four and a half, five tons per acre. So that would be two point, I don't know, be, I guess eight to 10 tons per hectare, something like that. My math, I'm sorry, I had two sips of wine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it's early for you guys, <laughs> earlier. Anybody that can go on, use their calculator, can, can take uh, uh, five tons per acre and make it into a hectare. <laughs> now, Thank if you're spacing you. closer yeah. together, if your spacing is closer together, like um, two meter between the rows, your yield will go up because you have more linear feet of canopy per hectare, uh, right. given, let's say, similar soil and similar vigor mm -hmm. um, than 
obviously from there, there's a thousand shades of gray in terms of the intent of the winemaker and the grower as to what the wine is intended for and what level of marketplace you're trying to achieve. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Phil. Thank you very much, Phil and Geneviève. Uh, merci pour cette incursion dans le Livermore ABA. Uh, <coughs> maintenant, on va continuer notre uh, voyage en Californie et on se retrouve maintenant dans les vignobles de l'ABA Oakville, qui se situe dans le Napa Valley. Donc, on va maintenant passer le micro à Alexander Smith et Susan Groth de Groth Vineyards and Winery. Donc, Alexander et Susan, parlez-nous un petit peu de l'histoire familiale de Groth, s'il vous plaît. Oui, bonjour. Euh, donc, euh, bonjour, euh, je me présente Alexander Smith, euh, sommelier et amoureux de vin. Euh, je suis le cofondateur avec ma conjointe euh, Dominique Lavoie de Vin par Alexander. Une agence qui représente surtout des vins de Nouveau Monde et certains de plus grands vins que les États-Unis ont à offrir. Euh, nos partenaires incluent euh, Spotswood, Dalla Valley, Bevan Sellers et bien sûr Growth. Euh, L'année 2020 n'a pas, euh, pas été facile pour la restauration et donc pour le sommier, mais j'espère que vous gardez votre amour pour le vin, vos amours pour le vin et il ne faut pas lâcher. So, Groth Vineyards and Winery is situated in Oakville, Napa, and one of the most perfect spots within the Napa Valley to produce Cabernet Sauvignon. Founded in 1981, Groth is a family-owned and operated winery, which is both sustainable and true to their origins. Don't expect any jammy, sugary, ripe wines from Groth. These are true Napa Cabernets uh, with strong dark fruit, uh, perfumey notes, spiciness, a little bit along with elegant structure and phenomenal ageability. These are true wines of place where the word terroir can often be used. Um, those who, who, who are tasting the wine today will get the chance to taste the Oakville 2015 and the Reserve 2016. Uh, the Reserve 2016 uh, actually came in at number four of the top 100 um, of the Wine Spectator, top wines in 2019. Uh, Robert Parker actually awarded his first ever 100 points to any wine in Napa uh, to Groth back in 1985. And they've been in the top 100 um, eight, uh, eight times in total. So it just shows that Groth are really able to produce consistently some world-class wines. Uh, both of these wines uh, are available in the SAQ. There are only a few bottles remaining. Um, so I'm going to talk, stop talking and I am going to pass uh, the mic over to Suzanne Groth, who is the second generation uh, in Groth family, to tell us a little bit why Groth wines are so unique and special and more importantly, uh, why everybody in Quebec needs to drink these benchmark wines which are rooted in Oakville. So Suzanne, I believe you have a presentation and I will pass mm, the mic over. Merci, Alexandre. Um, hello, everybody. It's so nice to be here with you. And I love hearing Phil's stories. So Phil and I know each other well. Um, we, we work together a lot with Wine Institute in California and then all over the US. So it's a really fun time to, to hear his stories this morning because um, his stories go back so much farther than Groth's. So, you know, my German family didn't get it together to get on a boat and get over here until the 1930s. They would have emigrated actually the 19 teens. So prior to World War II, but in between World War I and II, the Groth family got on a boat and ended up in Ohio and it was the Great Depression that would have cast us out to California. So Phil's family, pff, they'd already got it figured out by then. I think you guys had the house built in Tahoe and you had the area all staked out. And, uh, you know, I love how he gets to say, Sankyem generation, right? I'm only Dizian, so I've just got a little number two here. We've, uh, we've grown the third generation. My kids are now just 18 and 14, so we're working on that third generation, raising them in the business, but we're trying to catch up with those Wentees, man. They're on generation five and six now, so I, I'll never catch up. 
But Wente family is a big part of the Groth family history in the wine business. Because unlike Phil's family, who really had it all together, they probably brought the suitcase clones with them and they were growing them all over. Um, and they did have some farming experience in Napa. And then of course, took it down to San Francisco Bay Area because it was closer to the people that were actually living here. So that was really smart actually to be a train right away or a carriage right away from San Francisco, the biggest market, because this is long before the automobile, right? The Groff family uh, ends up in Santa Clara Valley or Silicon Valley, as it's affectionately referred to, very close to Livermore. So Livermore was my parents' um, backyard wine country excursion. They are German immigrant uh, beer drinking types, not wine drinking types. I would love to tell you my family had a lot of history drinking wine. They didn't. Uh, they're my dad, Dennis, and my mom, Judy. As a young couple, uh, probably even before they were of legal drinking age, I'll confess, would sneak over uh, to a wine shop, buy some wine, and uh, try it in a picnic basket. They would often come to Napa or Sonoma or Livermore. In fact, my father's history uh, at Wente goes back to his days as a young accountant. So if anybody has any accountants in the family, one of the jobs that the young accountants do is they get sent out to the factories or the place of business where they need to actually do an audit. So my dad's job at Wente would have been to come out, audit the books, make sure the inventory matched the paperwork, right? And start helping them with their tax preparation. Now, when he finished crunching numbers, you know, and this is back in the 60s, remember too, he would have uh, been offered a little taste of Wente wine. And any savvy accountant can start doing the math pretty quick. So he asked how much a bottle of the, his favorite was the Grey Riesling at the time. They were very famous for this wine, much like Blue Nun or Lied from Milch, this wine was hot in the 60s. Every housewife in America loved Wente Grey Riesling. It was very popular. And to the point where my family jokes that I was most likely conceived on Wente Grey Riesling. It's an embarrassing little fact to mention, but I guess that was their total wine of choice. And I have no idea how much the wine would have been, but it must have been a great price, Phil, because my father would buy a bottle and then ask, well, wait, how much if I buy two bottles? How much if I buy 12 bottles? And so his very first wine deal would have been in 19, late 60s, it has to be, he decided to put together all the accountants and buy a pallet, a mixed pallet of, which is 56 cases of Wente wines and had it delivered to their cul-de-sac. They were living in Los Gatos near San Jose at the time. And then all the accountants came over, picked up their, their case and handed Dennis Groth their check. So I always say that was his first deal in the wine industry, 25 years before he ever bought a vineyard. So Wente's and Gross, I mean, you, you, I guess without Wente, there'd be no Gross in, in a way. My parents wouldn't have learned about the wine business. But fast forward, indeed they did. In the 1980s, my father was a uh, finance guy for a company called Atari. Now, maybe some of you don't know, you're too young to remember, but the very first video game ever put on the market was from Atari. Atari 2600 was a video game that kids could play on their television at home. And so when my father went to working from a accounting firm, very boring for an eight-year-old girl, to working at Atari, I was very excited about his new job. So we were super pleased to be, you know, in the video game business at that time. But Atari, although it supplied the means for my parents to get into the wine business to actually come up to Napa and invest that money in a vineyard. It was certainly not their vision that they would launch into the wine business right away. They were 39 the year that they bought a vineyard in Oakville, uh, 121 acres total. And I'm sorry, I forgot to remind you, Alexander, are you driving or is Paul the uh, presentation? I am. Put it up here. Let's go to the next slide and we'll start seeing some pictures of Groth. So here we are. It didn't look like this when we got here. Um, of course, the mountains were here. Uh, the, you're looking at Napa Valley uh, from the Oakville perspective, and you're looking up to Mount St. Helena, which is kind of the most prominent of our volcanic structures in the valley here. Um, we're right smack in the middle, or as we like to say, the heart of Napa Valley, in a little town called Oakville. The town was here when my parents arrived. Of course, the most famous vintner in Oakville was Robert Mondavi. My parents, as a young couple, would have come up to Napa Valley to taste wine, and Mondavi would have been one of the first wineries they would visit, along with Louis Martini, perhaps Boye Vineyard, uh, Behringer. There were only 12 or 14, a small handful. Um, there, were, there was really just this, this growth happening in Napa in the 1960s and 70s, 
But uh, in between 1972 and 1982, the year that we actually started in the wine business making wine, uh, there would have been less than 100 wineries in Napa Valley. Just for a quick little perspective, there are easily over 700 wineries here in Napa Valley. Some make multiple labels. If you break it down to actual wineries or class two licenses as we're structured, there's probably closer to 450, 475. But that is a big growth in just the 40 years that we've been here. So it's pretty remarkable to think. And of course, Phil's got more stories just like that. Why don't we go to the next slide? So we like to say we're rooted in Oakville. What does that mean? Um, so my parents, as I mentioned, they arrived, and by the way, they're 79 this year, and they're in the winery most days. So uh, I like to say that uh, it's all in the Cabernet. You too could work to 79 if you just kept drinking the wine, right, Phil? <laughs> it's a longevity industry. It's a family business, and uh, we have been here with these two estates. We own the biggest estate where our winery is, the pictures you're seeing, is our 121 acre estate here in Oakville. But then we turned right around in 1982, just a year later, my parents bought another vineyard in the Oak Knoll district. This is very close. It's only seven miles south of us here in Oakville. The Oak Knoll district is more famous for the little town of Yauntville that is there. So if any of you get a chance to visit us here in Napa Valley, make sure that you stop into Yauntville as well for some beautiful beautiful food from, gosh, famed French Laundry, Bouchon Bakery, we've got it all. Um, this is part of our uh, estate uh, and our plan is, as Phil was talking about earlier, to be sustainably farmed. What does that mean? Um, it's confusing, isn't it? We have biodynamic, we have organic, and they all seem to have their own nuance. But I love what Phil called out earlier. And this was really the Wine Institute program launched back in the 1980s with Phil's help, was to think about everything. If we're gonna be these families living on these farms, we wanna farm sustainably and healthfully for ourselves our families and for our employees as well who are out here working every day. So some of our techniques are uh, utilizing cover crop to increase the health of the overall soil, whether that's to get more nitrogen into some parts of the soil or to just, you know, beef up, uh, you know, a variety of other things that you're trying to, you know, calcium, a variety of things in the soil that sometimes you need to amend. And how do we want to do that without actually using chemical or agro farming that was very, very typical in the 1960s, 1970s. And in a way, it's hearkening back to an earlier time. Farming sustainably or even organically means that you're using more old fashioned techniques that would have happened before we had access to chemical farming, right? And at least that's what it means to grow up. And let's go to the next slide. So growth is, you know, part of, um, you know, we were talking about scores earlier. That was very kind of Alexander. Um, yeah, I mean, my parents got into this business. They didn't even have a winery. And, uh, but one of the things that, you know, was happening, Nils Vange, our very first winemaker, he would regularly meet with the press. Um, the wine advocate, Robert Parker, did give the 85 Reserve, just their, that would have been their third vintage in the industry, uh, a perfect score, 100 points. What does that mean? I, I really reference it because it went from absolute total obscurity to, yeah, maybe somebody's heard of you, right? I mean, there were a lot of California wineries coming on, a lot of them coming out to the market. And my father's experience, you know, he was still working his day job at Atari and trying to get the business going on the weekends. He would go out, if he were in New York, uh, you know, doing Atari business, he might stop into Sherry Lehman, a beautiful wine shop in New York City, and say, hey, do you carry any California wine? And they would kind of shake their head and look kind of odd, like, no, man, we sell Bordeaux, we sell Burgundy, we don't, we don't sell California wine. So back in the 80s when he was getting his start, it was still a really hard sell to sell California wine. So it was wonderful to get a little press, a little acknowledgement that uh, somebody had heard of us and, and it, de it really did help. It helped us, us you know, establish a relationship with distributors all over the country. We went from having representation in maybe five states to every state in the, in the US was able to carry us. And, and today, of course, we can do some export as well. Um, but of course, it's not about one score from the 1985 reserve, right? You gotta do it again and prove yourself again and again. So we have just our third winemaker in our 40 years history now, uh, Nils Vangie I mentioned earlier. 
then Michael Weiss uh, for 27 of those years, and more recently, Cameron Perry came aboard in 2014. And so just three winemakers, but one family and one long, consistent farming of our vineyard is kind of really what I like to talk about more than I talk about press. Why don't we go to the next slide? So Oakville, or as affectionately referred to as by James Molesworth in the Wine Spectator recently, the filet mignon of Napa Valley, and, and filet it is, right? I mean, look at these names up here. I always get accused of name dropping, and of course I am, right? You know, Mr. Mandavi started all off here, again, post-prohibition in the 1960s. In fact, uh, Robert Mandavi was the first new winery built in Napa Valley post-prohibition. I always think that's very important because there was a long stretch uh, you know, of course, you know, uh, you know, during Prohibition, no production, but no new vineyards planted. Imagine, like, all of these families pulled out vineyard and put in walnuts. Maybe they farmed cattle, anything to keep the family business going. So very, very little grapes um, planted and new vineyard developed or planted back until the 70s and 80s. And then we see a tremendous area of growth. So Mandavi was here. They started their other project, uh, of course, in production with the Rothschild family, Opus One. But then you see other very well-recognized names here. The Franciscan Estate, Flora Springs, Swanson family. Um, you know, newer neighbors uh, in the 90s come along, Bill Harlan being one, and Jean Phillips of Screaming Eagle. And she's located way on that east side there. There's a lot of diversity in Oakville today as far as, you know, brands, there were only 14 when the ABA was formed, about 1992. It took a little bit of arguing with some, you know, I'm mentioning all these names up here. These are big personalities. So imagine 12 people coming to a table and trying to split up Oakville and write the paperwork to go to the federal government and explain why Oakville should be a recognized ABA or American Viticultural Area. It took a couple of years of, of a few arguments, and I remember hearing about them. I would have been uh, away at college at that time, but it really was an exciting moment for Oakville to kind of step out and be recognized as its own distinct area. Um, get, let's see, there was, oh, I was going to also mention the fact that when my parents arrived, very little of Oakville was planted to Cabernet Sauvignon. My parents were really lucky. There was about 40 acres of cab here, and that's why they were interested in the property. But there was Riesling, there was uh, Napa Gamay. I mean, there were varietals we don't plant in Oakville, and we don't, we barely see in California anymore. So it was really, had been planted to everything in those 70s and 80s as people were experimenting with all kinds of things to grow here in the Oakville area. And we were considered too far south from the St. Helena region or, uh, you know, Stag's Leap, St. Helena. These were the recognized areas in the 1970s for great Cabernet and Napa Valley. But, it, you know, Mandavi really had to try hard to convince people that great cab was going to come from Oakville. And, and again, indeed, it took until like the 90s, really, for us to catch on with that. Today, 90% of what you're going to see planted and coming out of Oakville is Cabernet or a supporting player like Merlot and Petit Verdot. We grow both on our estate here. Next slide, please. Just another shot here to kind of show you how close we are. Napa Valley, I describe it as a long bowling alley, right? You've got 30 miles long and three miles wide at its absolute widest. We're one of the widest points here. So you're looking at Mount St. John uh, just to the west. That's the part of the Mayakama region and then, or uh, uh, mountain range, pardon me. And then the mountain range behind us from this viewer point would be the Vaca mountain range. So together, these two mountain ranges form almost a, you know, a V to the valley so that really we all are alluvial soil or soils coming off these mountains, right? We're cut by fluvial soils, river soils, so the Napa River. On our property, we have Con Creek. So these river sources have deposited other soils from other areas, but predominantly most of us here in Oakville have these uh, volcanic natures. They're very different. Mayakama, or where the Tokalon estate is, is very different soil from, say, the east side, where Maya Dalla Valley is growing her beautiful wines or Screaming Eagle is. Those are uh, completely different mountain ranges, different ages, and so have produced volcanic soil, surely, but different kinds. And so you get different nuances of flavor within different parts of Oakville, which is wonderful and makes it exciting, actually. Let me go to the next slide. 
All right, so this is um, the little vineyard shot we've got here. And the wines that we're tasting are gonna be coming out of the block that's marked under the hop swing there, the reserve blocks. That's where my, my, my top Premier Cuvée has to come from, from that reserve block. And then the Oakville is coming from, it's a, it's a combination. We will declassify some of the fruit from those prime reserve blocks into our Oakville Cabernet. And then we farm some of it in the block two and block nine there in the center. The reason being that we've identified the reserve spot is so superior is the rock that is in it. It's loaded with gravel and rock. And what does that mean when it comes to farming Cabernet? It means drainage. So um, what we've discovered really from the neighbor from the time we arrived here, Justin Meyer was the man who put this whole vineyard together. Justin is synonymous with Cabernet Sauvignon in Napa because he started, well, he was, his day job was Franciscan, but he was also starting a winery called Silver Oak. And Silver Oak, right across the street from us, was the only of uh, the first winery that ever made 100% just a one varietal, Cabernet Sauvignon. Justin believed in Cabernet. He had a little joke he would say about himself that he would drink Cabernet with his cornflakes and I saw him do it once. So he was, he was very dedicated to Cabernet. But he also convinced my parents and our new winemaker at the time, Nils Vangie, that there was a sweet spot within the vineyard and he told Nils to keep an eye on it. And that indeed was that reserve block as I referred to it there earlier as the most superior site for Cabernet on our property. Now talking about clones, I'm so glad Phil got into all of that clone talk. It is, Phil, what is the, is it the Kincannon clone? Is clone seven for Cabernet that we see mostly? Yes, well, at least UC Davis sourced that from the Kincannon Vineyard, uh, took it to Davis as a, and then started a single vine clone of seven and eight. Phil is being really modest here. If it weren't for the Wentys and the Kincannons, we would have had no good material that had been present and grown here in our own soils. Now, why is this important? I mean, exactly what he called out. We were doing suitcase clones. We were stealing clones from each other, or, you know, maybe, maybe if I went to see Phil, he might give me some clonal material to try on my vineyard. But that's exactly how pests were spread. And Phil can tell you a lot more about this than I can. But when you have, when you plant a new vineyard, one of the things you really want to do after you figure out what rootstock you want to use and what clone you want to use, you want to make sure you have clean material that is virus free. Because the worst thing, and Phil can attest to this, is to plant a vineyard and four years in, you've got leaf roll, you've got, uh, you, you call it out, Phil, you've got all kinds of stuff. So clean material is the most important thing. He's just nodding, so I'm gonna go with that, yes? Well, no, I completely agree. And that's why UC Davis started their foundation vineyard nursery uh, to put vines through a heat treatment process uh, to clean up all the virus so that as sort of a new generation of vineyards were planted from the 60s forward, they were planted with clean stock. Exactly. So today, when we plant a new vineyard, and Groff has a sustainable plan for the next, literally, until, gosh, I think I turn 80 the year we're done with this, we plant just a small piece of our estate at a time, two to five acres every year to renew the vineyard. And when we do that, we have the opportunity to kind of try new things, right? So we could try a new clone, we could try a new rootstock, we could try a new trellising system, but we have to plan two years in advance to put that order into the vineyard nursery. So now instead of like in the 1970s where you would plant rootstock, wait one year and come on and graft on the fruit, traditionally what most of us do is actually order it up from a nursery that has been planning ahead and propagating the right vitis vinifera on the right rootstock that we've requested. And then when they arrive here, they're considered you traditionally green growers are what arrive here. So they might have a leaf or two at the top, or they might, they might be bare root. And we just introduce it and wait for the spring. And that's when we begin the process of calling the first growth or the first leaf, second leaf, third leaf, and then we wait till the fourth leaf. So you can see when you're replanting a vineyard, it's an enormous amount of time invested in your vineyard as well. So you have to kind of plan ahead in your marketing scheme as well to make sure that you have good supply and steady. It's a little tricky. 
Um, what Susanna, else Susanna, just uh, just a quick question. Uh, yes. They uh, yes, they uh, Francois is asking regarding the uh, reserve block. Yes. Um, you know, how is it superior different? I imagine it's it's you know, is 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 it soil? Is there sort of ah, special clones in there? I'm so glad. Uh, is it fairy dust? Uh, like what's uh, <laughs> so, you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier, we talked to Justin Meyer. So he was the guy who really, you know, he had the know-how of the vineyard. He'd already been here a decade and he planted the vineyard, developed it and had experience making wines. Um, if you are a fan of Silver Oak and you've ever seen a Bonnie's vineyard, it would have been a Bonnie's Cabernet made from just five acres. That acreage is behind our estate and his widow Bonnie still grows Cabernet there today. But in, uh, gosh, it would have been the 70s all the way through to 1992, he made a single varietal or single vineyard wine called Bonnie's Vineyard. So he had a lot of experience experimenting with this part of the vineyard because it exactly lines up with the reserve block. In fact, that's why he negotiated for the five acres and the house to raise his family in just there situated behind our barn. But uh, along came a geologist, his name is David Howell. And he's written a book called The Winemaker's Dance and it's about the geology of Napa Valley. He also lectures at Stanford on the geology of wine and what can, what, how geology can affect grape growing in different regions. He's fascinated with Cabernet. He's fascinated with spending time in Napa, luckily. So he spent a lot of time walking in our vineyards with us and with most of our Oakville neighbors. He was quick to point out that this rock, and it's kind of hard to see here, but it's very gray and it has some white striations. This is Franciscan, very typical. You will find this all over California. The other rock he found, and this is what puzzled him, he found a sedimentary stone called Chert. It's C-H-E-R-T. Chert is common on the West Coast. Sometimes it's green, uh, sometimes it's this reddish color, but it's not common in our part of Napa Valley. In fact, um, this is one of the few spots it's found in Bonnie's Vineyard, in our vineyard, and across the street along the Con Creek. And then you don't find it until, uh, gosh, way over in Sonoma County. So how did this rock end up here? Well, David Howell started looking around for its source and found it in the Con River Valley. Well, this is part of an ancient, we are part of an ancient, you know, uh, watershed, essentially, all part of the same watershed that would drain through Napa and all the way out to the bay. The Napa River is just a tiny remnant of that real watershed. This would have happened even, this is, we're talking about, uh, you know, a millennia ago kind of occurrence before the Vaca mountain range was even formed. So he can age the deposit of this rock here in our vineyard before the Vaca mountain range was formed. So pretty interesting, pretty ancient deposit, not much of it left here and certainly not much in the center of our vineyard. And then on the east side of our vineyard, you might've noticed in that map, that we have Sauvignon Blanc planted in part of our vineyard. Why are we growing Sauvignon Blanc in Oakville, in the, in, in the tenderloin of you know, cab production? And the easy answer is we can't get it to ripen. You can't make Cabernet ripen in deep clay soils that hold on to a lot of moisture. We tried it. When my parents first arrived, they had, uh, there was Cabernet planted there. They planted more and it tasted like green asparagus. So it took us about another 10 years to yank it out and realize we just couldn't get it to ripen in that particular spot. In fact, it was Michael Weiss, our second winemaker, who arrived in 1994 that said, I'm not going to use any of the Cabernet out in, in that block, so let's plant some Sauvignon Blanc and get something to really ripen out there. Sauvignon Blanc is kind of notorious for ripening where Cabernet won't. It likes the hot temperatures. It, it responds very, very well. Of course, we learned this from the Bordelais but it, uh, it can handle all that moisture and, uh, and, and tends to be a heavy producer as a result too. But Phil and I, we can get into that conversation later. <laughs> um, does that answer the question, Alexander? Yeah, I think it does. Also, just cool. another question, uh, yeah. just before we go onto the, onto the, onto the tasting. Uh, somebody asked regarding um, planting new vines uh, yes. throughout the years. You know, do you have any plans to plant? Less seen varieties in California. Obviously, that's uh, that's a question regarding climate, etc. Climate mm, change. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so I know we could probably spend about you know maybe three weeks on this particular subject, but <laughs> it's could. a bigger. Uh, we could, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> we could. It's it's a it's a big topic, but uh, I'll let I you try somebody, and answer it. 
I think everybody's going to have to come down here and we're going to have a long lunch and Phil and I can yeah. answer all <laughs> these questions and just as soon as we're allowed to do that. Absolutely. <laughs> real quick, I mean, we can, of course, have we changed things on our estate since we arrived? I've, I've already described that we have, right? But it has more to do with us learning about the property itself and, you know, taste change, the market changes. Phil mentioned this earlier. You grow what you can sell because if you don't, you're not very sustainable in that sense. I, I certainly am not going to make it to the fifth generation um, just growing what I want to drink, right? We have to grow what will actually sell in the market. Groth only makes four wines. We're tasting two today, but we make we also make a Sauvignon Blanc, as I mentioned, um, and we make a Chardonnay, which is also a Winty clone, by the way. That's what we grow at our Hillview Estate. So um, already there's another connection between Groth and Winty, but uh, full confession, uh, I don't know, I think 60%, 70% of the Chardonnay planted in the state of California is Wente clone. Right, Phil? It's a lot of it. Well, of some origin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's mostly that clone. So I think that's that's another, you know, gift that we have from, from people who farmed here a really long time, like the Wentys. Um, yeah, I mean, again, have we planted? Yeah, we planted Semillon because we love it, because we blend it with our Sauvignon Blanc. We've planted Petit Verdot recently. That's the first new red varietal we've introduced to the estate. We do grow Merlot at our Hillview estate, and I will reintroduce it here to Oakville. Um, but I don't have any plans to uh, introduce, uh, you know, uh, Tempranillo. No, not at the moment. So I think we'll continue to get smarter on how we farm, again, with trellising, other techniques, maybe trying different clones. But at the moment, I'm with Phil. I think we'll see, we might see some, some gradual smaller changes, but what we've noticed in our 40 years farming here is that there are times when things are certainly drier, but sometimes they are cooler, as, as Phil called out. You know, the Bay has an enormous influence on all of these wine growing regions situated around them. I'm just on the north side of the bay where he's on the south side. So very, Perfect. great, we're very tied to the bay in that sense. Okay, so let's do some wine, geez. Can I, can, 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 do you think I can just ask just, just two more questions before we, yes. uh, before we oh, go sure. on to the wine? Sure. Um, firstly, just a um, uh, question from Claude regarding dry, dry farming. Um, is dry farming dead given the climate changes? Interesting. Um, I, I know uh, there's a lot of, uh, I know um, there, there, there is a lot of irrigation uh, in Napa, but I know there are people who do do dry farming. So uh, I don't know if you would like to just respond quickly regarding the dry farming. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you can see in this picture, there are irrigation, uh, you know, strong in the vineyard itself. So what we tend to find, first of all, we're on the valley floor. So we almost have the opposite problem to many people. We have too much water. Um, we have right now, if you were to visit, you'd see a lot of green, a lot of weeds uh, in the vineyard. It's actually our cover crop that we introduce to kind of suck the moisture out of the soil. We on the reserve part of the block where you're seeing a picture right now, this is very, very well drained. So vines have to work harder to get moisture here in the summer, but on the east side of my property where it's loaded with that clay that I told you about, it holds on to water all season long. So we might let that cover crop go through June. Um, in 2017, we had so much rain, we had to let it go all the way through the summer before we mowed it. I mean, maybe 30 days before we started picking. So we, we do the opposite. We try and draw moisture out of the ground because it almost has too much access to water and too much vigor in those Eastern blocks, which is another reason why we grow Cabernet on the Western block where it's super well drained with all that gravel and rock. But great question. I mean, we also have to have water on this property for frost protection. So when you visit a vineyard in the middle of a valley like ours, on the mountains, they're very protected from frost, right? Um, maybe even Phil doesn't even have this problem where he's at with uh, the fog and kind of temperature control with fog. But our temperatures drop. So even, you know, during key right, like days, like um, really we start doing frost protection about, we start watching things about March and then into April. And as the vineyard is emerging, usually with Sauvignon Blanc first, we have to protect those tender shoots. If they're exposed to 32 degree temperature, they freeze and then we're just devastating frost loss. So we're very careful and have water present at all times on, the, on this vineyard at least. 
With our Hillview Vineyard, which is nestled right at the base of the Mayakama region, we don't have to worry about frost almost there at all. Maybe every 10 years we'll turn on the fans and we have uh, just vineyard fans to kind of moderate the temperatures and stir things up a bit. But this vineyard that you're looking at, we have a lot of frost issues and we have to be very careful about every 10 years we can have a pretty, um, we could have a big loss to frost. Does that answer I the think, water question? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's perfect. I think something's very important as well for those who don't, who haven't been to Napa. Um, you know, I, I've been there a lot, a lot of times. And, you know, in the morning, I always go out for a walk or a run. And I think I'm just going to wear a t-shirt and shorts and I'm always cold. Yeah, exactly. uh, the, fo yeah. the, fog, the fog does keep it pretty cool. So, of course, all the grapes are able to uh, adjust yeah. that accordingly. Uh, and then one other question, and if we have mm -hmm. time, we will answer the other one. Is just, it, it's, I, I, I love this question. Uh, 2017 vintage um, yeah. has had horrible press. But every single oh. 2017 vintage wine I have tasted, I absolutely love it. Um, could you just quickly mention regarding the 2017? I know that'll probably be the sure. next vintage we'll get in Quebec. I'm a huge fan of 17. Me but, too, uh, yeah. I love it, it's so pretty. Yeah, we're gonna release the 17s uh, in a couple of months here. And wow, uh, it was a challenging vintage, but only in the last four days of the vintage itself, right? Um, we had fire and it, it occurred and it, it just really sparked up. Man, we were 95% finished with pick already. Um, Napa was uh, inundated with fire in three different locations. We had some freakish winds. Typically the Santa Ana's affect Southern California. My neighbors way far to the South. We don't typically have these strong winds, but we did that year and we have had in years uh, after that as well, more recently. So it really can be, um, it can be pretty scary and devastating. But again, that particular vintage, we had picked almost everything. We had just a little bit of fruit out there and we kind of scrambled for a day or two that our biggest problem that vintage was I had no power because of course when the power companies realized that their power lines were sparking fires up in the mountains uh, they cut off everybody's power and Oakville frequently loses power so my biggest challenge was getting a backup generator here um, and, and cooling back our cellars and also venting them most importantly when you're uh, in the middle of harvest and you've got a cellar full of tanks going through fermentation, it produces an enormous amount of CO2. Without power to have the fans to pull the CO2 out of the cellar, they were like little death traps. So I couldn't let my crew back into the cellar until we were able to vent the cellars out by getting a backup generator. So that, again, that was a scramble for three or four days. Pretty scary for sure. Um, but you guys probably saw more about it than I did because being here in the middle of it, not having any power, and finishing up harvest, we I didn't look at the news until it was all over. I was kind of glad. I think the news kind of, as always, makes everything look scarier yeah, than it really sure. is, right? But good question. Yeah, and the 17s are glorious. The only stuff we ended up putting up in the bottle was pre-fire pick. Everything else was really dealt with with declassification because we just didn't know enough about it at that time, too. Perfect. Shall we try some wines? Let's try some Yeah. So we've got the 2015, what we affectionately refer to as the Oakville. So um, what does that mean? They're both Oakville. Um, the only Cabernet we make is Oakville. Uh, but this wine, when we first arrived in Napa, my parents, it was the wine that my parents dreamed of making. It was just the Napa Valley Cabernet, right? So if you taste a Groth Cabernet out there um, that's not the reserve with the red stripe, you will be tasting our Napa Valley Cab until the 19, gosh, it would have been, uh, Oakville ABA was formed in 92, and I think by 95, we were using Oakville. So Oakville and then Napa Valley, it's called conjunctive labeling. So you have to have both on there to tell everybody where the wine's from, because there is an Oakville, Canada, right? It's, uh, it's just in the Toronto region. So we don't want to get confused. So we have Napa Valley on there as well. And what does that mean uh, legally? It means 80% of what is in this bottle must come from just this little area. Oakville is uh, 5,700 acres planted. So what are we, 2,300 hectares in that area? I was doing my math frantically when Phil was quickly doing his calculations. I was impressed. But Oakville is a really small region in Napa Valley. And uh, it has to come mostly sourced from that area. All of our fruit, with the exception of the Merlot in this particular wine, is sourced here in Oakville. Today, we do buy some grapes from a couple of my neighbors. 
Um, one of them is Ren Harris at Paradigm. He's a beautiful little brand here called Paradigm. And then Alex Viborny on the east side farms some beautiful grapes here in Oakville. And a number of us Oakville brands purchased some grapes from these guys. And that has allowed us to source from different parts of Oakville and really get this beautiful blend. We do combine it with the fruit from our own estate here. About 60% of the fruit is still coming from our estate here in Oakville. It's really quite um, soft and elegant too. I'm sure it's something, I hope it's something that you notice when you try the wine. It has a lot of velvet, a lot of you know, beautiful structure, but don't let the softness lull you into thinking the wines won't age. These wines age beautifully. Um, there are vintages of our Cabernets, both Reserve and the Oakville today, that uh, sometimes at 10, 12, 15, 25 years. So 1986 Reserve, for example, is one of my favorite uh, wines from the cellar to try right now, and just gorgeous with a balance of fruit to tannin. But softer tannin structure on our valley floor here. Mm. Let's go to the next slide. I think we got one more on this wine. Um, I mentioned the Oakville AVA already. Uh, it is 15% Merlot. That is the blending wine, and that's coming from our estate at Hillview. And 22 months in French oak. Um, we use a balance. This, this wine, we use two and four, two four year old barrels, so two, three, and four year old barrels. We like it to be a bit softer. We don't like a lot of new oak on this wine because we really feel like this is a wine that could uh, benefit from some, you know, so have it with a burger, right? You know, have it with your steak tonight. This is my wine that we would offer that people could really enjoy right now, but certainly lay down for five to 10 more years. All right, and let's talk about reserve, right? We've already really talked about it all, huh? Um, so this wine is, that's a picture of our reserve block there. And this wine is really dependent on those, those blocks, as I mentioned. It's a wine of place, not just a selection in our cellar. I know sometimes the reserve word, um, it doesn't really have any legal meaning in the US, right? It's, uh, it could sometimes be a barrel cuvee. It could be a choice of the winemaker. But for Groth Reserve means exactly what you're looking at, that section of our vineyard. Um, and let's go to the next slide, too. So I talked about the dirt earlier and my rocks. So this is just uh, that reddish rock there. And then the gray rock is that Franciscan. So this is just to remind everybody that it's, it's, uh, it's all about the rock in this particular vineyard that makes this wine. All right, and then what else we got on my presentation here? Oh yeah, okay, good. So, yes, you know scores, right? It's it, it's. It, I'm glad that we have them, but that's about where I want to leave it. It's more about what the family does, what my team does, our farming. That we tend to spend a lot more time talking about those things. So, um, all the accolades about the wine are are in our little digital presentation that you guys are going to get shared with, but. Um, I don't really like to talk about them very much. We were, of course, we're excited to be number four wine spectator. We're number four. Woo. Sorry, I'd rather be number one, but I feel like this one is, is exquisite and I, I don't need the press to tell us, right? It's, it's really some beautiful wine. And let's go to the, uh, there we go, there's some more. So um, yeah, I mean, this wine is all about the location, but I've already told you all of that, right? It's, it's about the piece of our vineyard it's about where it comes from. And oh, I should mention, this is also 22 months. And we, this is the one wine growth is 100% new oak on. So this is the wine that we believe. We don't, we just don't think that every grape that we farm can be up to 100% new oak. I mean, it, it's like Phil was talking about earlier, Gewürztraminer being a spice. We think of oak as a spice. It's an additive, right? Everything else, you know, what Cameron, our winemaker says is, Everything else is, um, it takes away from the grapes. The grapes are perfect when they come into the cellar. And the winemaker's task is to guide them through the cellar without stripping away too much of that beautiful fruit. So oak is the one additive. So we're very, very cautious. We choose coopers that we have a long relationship with. In fact, when we introduce a new barrel maker or a new cooper, we try it for four years and we try the result with the rest of the blend before we just throw it into the cellar and put reserve cabinet. But this is the one wine that Groth does rely on all new oak, every vintage that we put in the bottle. All right, so I think that's my presentation, huh? Alexander, did I miss anything? 
No, I think uh, <laughs> the wine, the, the wine, great. wine is absolutely stunning. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure and I got you already knew that. Wrong. Phil can like help me with my, I didn't do any of my spacing. He handled that really, really well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's delicious. I'm glad you like it. I do. Phil, thank you for sharing your wines. I really enjoyed the beautiful morning fog and your beautiful well, cab. So what, what clone? You. I, what I rarely get to taste the Graz Reserve. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, and I really get to taste your wines too. So this was a lot of fun. Thank you. It was. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you very much, Phil. Absolutely. Um, Je crois que ça résume parfaitement une super première euh, session de sommelier, un webinaire très instructif. Donc, euh, j'espère que vous avez bien écouté les producteurs. On a maintenant quatre questions à poser euh, pour euh, gagner des, euh, des, des, des bouteilles qui ont été dégustées. Donc, euh, on va poser chaque question euh, séparément. La première personne qui répond correctement et le plus rapidement à chaque question se verra mériter une bouteille de vin. Euh, évidemment, les participants ne peuvent... Euh, euh, gagner qu'une seule bouteille. Euh, je tiens à mentionner aussi, on, on était euh, um, censé avoir Nikki Wente, euh, la fille de Philip, euh, qui était censée être avec nous aujourd'hui. Malheureusement, elle a eu une infection à la gorge, donc, euh, euh, mais pas la COVID. Et donc, euh, au moins, c'est euh, ça. Euh, mais la prochaine fois qu'on va avoir euh, un événement avec Wente, Nikki sera très certainement là aussi. Euh, Nikki, qui est la, une vigneronne de la cinquième génération. Donc, euh, au niveau des questions pour euh, remporter une bouteille, euh, Geneviève, as-tu des questions ici ou m'as-tu déjà envoyé ça ici? Non. <rire> On va commencer avec. Euh... Okay, J'en ai une, je peux. Tu veux que j'en fasse une maintenant? Bien sûr. OK. Um... Euh, Phil faisait référence, euh, bon, que ce n'était pas tant des clones de Chardonnay, mais quand même, si on est avec le terme clone, euh, il a fait référence à un qui était plus populaire que les autres euh, au niveau du Chardonnay. Euh, quel numéro avait-il, ce clone-là? Euh, oui, <rire> répondu, c'est le, le, le numéro 4. Oui. Le numéro 4, donc Maxime, qui se remporte une bouteille de euh, Wente Morning Fog Chardonnay, juste ici. Et par la suite, évidemment, on ne la voit pas. Euh, avec une deuxième question pour euh, remporter une bouteille de Wente Southern Hills Cabernet Sauvignon. OK. Euh, bon, ce qui me vient spontanément, ce serait, euh, est-ce que... Euh, est-ce que Wente euh, Vineyard euh, achète... Euh, des raisins ou du jus euh, pour élaborer leur vin. Non. <rire> voilà. Alors, Super. Donc, Elise Lambert qui se remporte la bouteille Allô, de Wente Southern Hills Cabernet Sauvignon. Maintenant, pour remporter la bouteille de Groth Oakville Cabernet Sauvignon 2015, euh, à l'exception de Groth, nommez un autre domaine viticole à Oakville. On a ici Luc Vien Opus. Est-ce que Opus, ça fonctionne, les juges? Oui. Tout à fait, super. Oui, Opus, ça Luc. Luc, qui, uh, by the way, on ne peut pas montrer l'image. Um, Luc Vien sent me a, a picture of him tasting the wines with an Atari T-shirt. Nice! <laughs> That's an extra point. <laughs> <laughs> Et finalement, pour euh, Broth Oakville Cabernet Sauvignon Réserve 2016, nommez un type de sol qui se trouve dans le vignoble de Broth et qui le rend parfait pour la culture du Cabernet Sauvignon. Je pense que Franciscan est la réponse à laquelle on, on cherchait. Donc, Dave Amel qui se remporte une bouteille de... Attends, il y a Maxime. Maxime, malheureusement, a déjà gagné un, un prix. Donc, Franciscan... C'est bon, ça, Alexander? Oui, c'est grave, ça. Super. Parfait. Donc, euh, je crois que ça résume parfaitement bien. On est bien. Une superbe session de sommelier, un webinaire très instructif. Euh, au nom de l'Institut des vins de Californie, je vous remercie de votre participation et pour vos questions super intéressantes. Euh, les questions auxquelles on n'a pas eu le temps de répondre, on va y répondre par courriel. 
Donc, euh, euh, n'ayez pas peur. J'ai vu que ça a quand même popé au niveau euh, des, des questions euh, durant la fin du webinaire. Euh, et euh, on va vous envoyer aussi le lien, euh, les fiches techniques, le PowerPoint et euh, le lien sur, pour le, le vidéo euh, dans les journées à, à venir. Donc, thank you very much, uh, Susan. Thank you very much, Philip. Merci, uh, Geneviève et Alexander aussi. Et ça termine notre première session de sommelier. Merci, tout le monde.